In Salt Lake City, I had the opportunity to speak with Union Pacific directly in the persons of Dan Harbeck and John Herring. So I grew up in North Dakota, Minnesota area. I grew up in a small town, about 1,700 people, half my life. Started in Omaha at our headquarters and moved to Salt Lake City about five years ago. And my role here is my office in Salt Lake and work across Utah, Idaho, and Montana, managing our public affairs. So really think of all the communities where we have rail operations, actually Union Pacific across our 23 state footprint. We operate in over 7,300 plus communities. Uh, we need to have a relationship with those folks on the ground, whether it be at a legislative level or from a regulatory standpoint, or just bare bones, uh, somebody has a railroad issue, who do you call? And it's nice to have a public presence to be able to do that. And for being a millennial, to say that I intend to make my career at a company like this, uh, yeah. it, it is a pretty strong thing to say. I know John has another yeah. side. I came from California, uh, hired out with the railroad uh, in California, worked as a brakeman. When I first hired out, I, I owned a lot of different businesses. I, I had the swimming pool company. I had um, I sold uh, blueprint machines. I did all kinds of things. And my brother-in-law worked for the Southern Pacific and said, uh, you know anybody that'd like to, to work for the railroad? And I said, you know, maybe for a couple of months, I'd like to try that. But it got my blood. <laughs> and like most people here, uh, once, once people hire out for this company, um, most day. Have you seen sizable changes or shifts in business? Salt Lake City, we have an intermodal hub here that was built in 2006. I mean, that's that's yesterday in terms of our company's history. I'm kind of surprised to even hear that Salt Lake City is an intermodal hub, being so far from a port. Utah has long been the crossroads of the West. Huh. And you think of where we're situated. Salt Lake City in the West, in two thirds of the U.S., is the middle. Hmm. And you think about the interstate convergence here as well as just going back to whether it was Brigham Young stepping foot here in Utah or the pounding of the Golden Spike, this was this was really the, the middle of the center. And so for us, as a railroad that has a footprint in the western two-thirds of the U.S., uh, this is still the crossroads of the West. And so as we look at our intermodal facilities, we've got facilities in Denver and down south and in Illinois, and we have a whole number, of course, in California. Uh, it made sense, given the marketplace, uh, to put a facility here. And uh, it's, 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 uh, it's been a, a smart decision for UP and for the community. Folks here can, uh, you've got major trucking operations like CR England, which is here, uh, that has a very large footprint that can use Union Pacific, or folks like UPS uh, can use Union Pacific. Union Pacific is 100% freight today. We can move one ton of freight 500 miles on one gallon of diesel. You're talking about the West, where you have this expanse of land. Uh, it, it, it changed the world, it changed, it changed this country. We move thousands and thousands of different commodities. We break them down into six basic groups. So you've got automotive, uh, you've got agricultural products, you've got chemicals, uh, gosh, you've got intermodal, which is our container business, you've got industrial products, and then you've also got energy, which is your coal business. One product might have to move more quickly than another product. So lettuce is gonna move more quickly than, say, scrap steel. So you have businesses that spring into business what you're seeing in terms of that drilling activity in north dakota uh, has caused a wholesale shift in terms of how the railroads handle that you do have you know, business fluctuations and supply and demand changes and commodities that people want to change but you've also got this incredibly work intensive hard to maintain difficult to install infrastructure that everything depends on how do those two sides work together and we've got about just here in utah it's about 1400 employees and you know 1,300 of them are out there working on the track and operating trains every day. Basically, we're maintaining uh, what we have. We uh, have machinery that checks the track. Um, we have an inspector that uh, drives uh, the track every day to make sure that there are no flaws, that, uh, that everything is the way it should be. Because when you're rolling a train, um, we have, to, uh, let's say, 10,000 tons of material, and you have uh, lives on board, uh, and you're moving at 60 or 70 miles an hour, you want to make sure that your your infrastructure or your track is in, in, in good condition. Just this year, uh, we're spending $3.6 billion, which is about 18% of our revenue that we're putting back. Uh, just over half of that is replacement cost. We're replacing about three miles of track a day and about 10,000 ties on average. Uh, but that's just to kind of turn the lights on. We're operating a factory without a roof over it. Our biggest customer is ourselves. We, we haul more product, more rail, more bounds, more material for ourselves than anybody else.